celebrating 41 seasons on the air. Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, we don't like mosquitoes, but the idea of genetically engineered mosquitoes is upsetting some folks even more. I think the biggest misconceptions are that these animals are going to get loose and somehow mate with native indigenous species and create some crazy mutant that's going to be resistant to everything and is going to eat your children while you sleep. People are just so scared. Also ahead, we'll look at how and why a corral trap is a recommended way to contain and control wild hogs on your land. In the kitchen, Natasha will share some delicious and creative ideas for enjoying the superfood avocado standby for recipe. And Gary Bachman will reveal his newest social media venture, one that the gardening community should love. Farm Week starts right now. Layton Span, Amy Myers is on assignment this week. Thanks for joining us. Two of Mississippi's agricultural commodities, timber and soybeans, are under attack. The U.S. Forest Service says a severe outbreak of southern pine beetle activity is underway in Mississippi, calling the situation unprecedented in scope. Officials estimate that 50,000 truckloads of pine timber have been destroyed in the state. One spokesperson says close to 4,000 spots of southern pine beetle infestation have been documented in ranger districts across Mississippi. The Forest Service is partnering with the State Forestry Commission to have the necessary manpower to address the crisis. Logging crews are currently cutting down infested trees to combat and suppress the pine beetle activity. Meanwhile, the Mississippi soybean crop is being threatened by a pest of a different type, the red-banded stink bug. The stink bug, seen here over my shoulder, is being found in increasing numbers in bean fields across the region now. At a recent emergency forum, Extension Entomologist said the outbreak is due to recent rainfall preventing farmers from applying pesticide in a timely manner. The red-banded stink bug can significantly impact soybean yields by lowering the quality of the maturing crop. It seems that growing wildflowers and plants that are native to the region's climate and soil type is more popular than ever. Native plants not only add beauty to an area, but support bees and wasps and other pollinators, which ultimately benefits all human life. Farm Week's Amy Myers has more on this from Mississippi State's Coastal Plains Branch Experiment Station. What science has proven in recent decades, nature's known since the beginning of time. We need more green space, particularly in urban areas. At the Wildflower Field Day, Extension Research Professor Brett Rushing told visitors wildflowers are a low-maintenance solution. Indigenous plants filter pollutants and dust from the air, provide shade to urban areas, and reduce erosion of soil into waterways. What this project does is uh, helps facilitate uh, the reintroduction of native plants, specifically wildflowers, into our landscape. Um, a lot of areas that we're trying to do this uh, include right-of-ways. So we work a lot with MDOT, um, city and county municipalities who might be managing right-of-ways. Uh, we also work with the county affiliates of Keep Mississippi Beautiful where they're going into unused areas and trying to reestablish wildflowers to try to, to beautify areas, to bring attention, uh, tourism to, to certain areas. Um, and just kind of bring back the native plants, native pollinators that, that used to be in that area. It's really uh, important to uh, attend these kind of events, again, because you have so many uh, specialists that come together in this one space uh, like we had here today. We had about a dozen people that specialize in this area and, and the different specialties within the area. So I talked about wildlife and backyard habitat but we also had native plant uh, species specialists. We had folks that actually uh, know how to put it in the ground, get it to successfully grow. This is where you can get a lot of great information that you just don't get from publications, websites, and things like that that you just simply Google or search for uh, on the internet. 
Another benefit of native plants and wildflowers is they stimulate a healthy ecosystem by attracting indigenous species like butterflies, pollinators, and mammals to the landscape. This results in a healthier environment for all of us. From Newton, Mississippi, I'm Amy Myers reporting. What serious gardener wouldn't like the idea of having almost constant contact with a gardening consultant? Well, guess what? In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman reveals some new developments in his social media channels. It means unprecedented access to gardening advice for you. Did you know that now you can have Southern Gardening with you wherever you go? We've taken the plunge into social media and share gardening information on many of the popular apps and websites. Last year, we introduced our Southern Gardening Facebook page. This has been a popular way to share our latest articles and answer questions directly from you. But following our other social media apps gives you more information on a daily basis from me. You have access to behind the scenes pictures and videos even a few selected bloopers that don't make it into one of the TV segments. Social media allows us to have two-way communication. The gardening community has never had access like this before. Imagine all this for free from a trusted landscape and garden source. Why Google when you have me? Our newest social media venture is the Facebook Live event Fridays with Southern Gardening. Every Friday at 10 a.m., I answer questions sent in and share my thoughts on making your garden and landscape more enjoyable. On Twitter, contact me at SoGardening. On Instagram, follow us at Southern Gardening. Or just plain old email at southerngardening at msstate.edu. You can always access many of the TV, radio, and newspaper columns at the MSU Extension website. Here you can view the archives and enjoy almost everything Southern Gardening going back to the very beginning in 1996. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and now through social media, you can see me everywhere on Southern Gardening. Gary says that through his social media channels, it is possible to get gardening tips on a daily basis. Well, let's shift gears, so to speak, to fruit. Uh, you may know have known that the avocado is a superfood with a lot of health benefits, but what are some ways to eat this fruit? Well, we have some answers in this week's segment of The Food Factor. MSU Extension's Natasha Haynes has a few ideas that she shares on how to enjoy avocados. On The Food Factor, we often spotlight the nutritional value of superfoods, but we don't always have time to tell you how to eat them. In this segment, enjoy some delicious recipes for avocados. If you're just now getting on board the avocado superfood train, you may not realize the many ways they can be enjoyed. Here are some delicious and creative ideas. For a protein-packed breakfast, try baked eggs and avocado topped with crumbled bacon and chives. Yummy! And it looks like they were made for each other. Another creative approach is to gently mash avocados together with lime juice, olive oil, salt, and pepper for some scrumptious avocado toast. One of my favorites is to add lemon dip avocado slices to ground turkey, chicken, or fish tacos for that extra punch of flavor. And don't forget the traditional methods that can be had with little preparation. Toss sliced avocados in your favorite salads, pair with fresh tomatoes from the garden, or add a unique twist to a lucky turkey sandwich. Just remember to keep the serving size to roughly a third of an avocado. Although they're nutritious, they can pack on the calories. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. And Natasha passes along this food for thought. One avocado has double the amount of potassium of a banana. Well, let's move into this week's Farm Week Trivia Quiz. Here is the question for you. What is the average weight of an adult male wild hog? Is the answer 155 pounds, 220 pounds, 
295 pounds, or D, 340 pounds? I'll have the answer a bit later in the program. That question brings us to our next story on Farm Week. Two weeks ago, we told you about the wild hog problem, one that's impacting numerous states across the country. Experts say that if something isn't done here in Mississippi, the problem could soon reach disastrous proportions. In part two of our hogumentary, Farm Week's Tim Allison shows you step by step some ways to build a trap to contain and control wild hogs on your land. In order to eradicate wild hog populations or reduce their damage to acceptable levels, landowners and land managers need to think in terms of large scale removal on an annual basis. Currently, trapping is the most effective and efficient practice by which this can be accomplished. Trapping is a continuous activity and requires far less time and effort than shooting and or hunting with dogs. In other words, you don't always have to be on site to be successful. Before you build a trap, first scout the property for areas of high use, such as travel routes, wallows, and loafing areas to locate potential trap sites. Begin baiting these sites with shelled whole kernel, dried, or fermented corn. Two sites per 100 acres is usually sufficient. Also be sure and consult your state wildlife agency to determine if a permit is required to trap wild hogs and to lawfully place corn or other baits on the ground for this purpose. Monitoring each site with a game camera is highly recommended. Camera footage will provide information as to how many groups of hogs are visiting the bait site and the number of individual hogs in each group. This information is useful in determining what size trap to build. Once pig activity has been confirmed at one of your bait sites, it's time to move in and set up a trap. In this video, an extension wildlife specialist will construct a circular corral trap. This type of trap is the most effective for capturing large groups or sounders of wild hogs in a single trapping event. Corral traps are relatively easy to build, taking a two-man crew less than an hour to erect. Also, as an additional benefit to the landowner, are often less expensive than the smaller prefabricated traps. The materials needed to construct this type of trap are as follows. A trap door of your choosing. Four to six, 16 feet by five feet welded wire livestock panels with no larger than four inch by four inch openings. 11 to 15 steel T-post. U-bolts or a roll of heavy gauge wire. And a package of 20 plus zip ties or cable ties. To begin building the corral trap, set the trap door in place and drive a T-post firmly into the ground on each side of it. Be sure the studded sides of the T-post are facing what will be the inside of the trap and that the post fits snug against each side of the trap door. With the door in place, position a livestock panel on each side of the trap door so that the ends of the panel and the door frame meet together. Be sure the horizontal strands of the livestock panels are facing the inside of the trap enclosure and the panel ends are positioned on the inside of the T-post against the studded side. Once properly aligned, secure the livestock panels and T-post using two to three steel U-bolts. With the trap door now in place and livestock panels attached on each side of the door, Move to the unattached open ends of each of the livestock panels and begin connecting the remaining panels. The adjoining sections should overlap each other by approximately 8 to 12 inches and then be secured together using either 5 8 inch cable clamps or heavy gauge wire. Complete the circle and fine tune the corral shape by pulling the joined panels in or out as necessary. When satisfied with the size and shape of the corral, begin working around the outside of the enclosure. Driving steel T-post into the ground at the middle of each overlap panel section and at the middle of each livestock panel itself. Again, make sure the wire panels fit snug against the T-post. You want the corral trap to be as strong as possible to resist any escape efforts by the pigs. Finally, one or two additional T-posts driven into the ground on each side of the trap door will provide added strength to the trap. This area is the most critical. 
As game camera footage of captured pigs suggest, they tend to focus most of their escape efforts at or alongside the trap door. Final construction of the trap is completed by fastening the livestock panels to the T-post using two U-bolts per post. One at the bottom of the panel, about 12 inches from the ground, and one just below the top strand. If using heavy gauge wire to fasten the livestock panels to the T-post, remember to use a wire fastener once every foot, beginning a few inches from the ground. This should result in five fasteners per T-post. Trapping wild hogs requires time and patience, especially in areas where they've been harassed by humans. So don't be alarmed if it takes as long as a week for all the hogs in a group to finally enter the trap. Although the trapping process may take longer than you anticipated, keep your eye on the prize of catching them all in one trapping event. And if you'd like to read more about wild hogs and watch even more videos, we've got a website for you. Head over to wildpiginfo.com. This website was set up by Mississippi State Extension. It has some really helpful resources if wild pigs are an issue where you live. Well, back to our trivia quiz now on Farm Week. We were asking, what is the average weight of an adult male wild hog? Well, here's the answer for you. It is 220 pounds. That is choice B. We're going to pause for a short break, but don't go anywhere. Still ahead, genetically engineered mosquitoes may be in our future one day. The lab-developed insects are being given the green light by the federal government. The transgenic variety may reduce the use of pesticides while also reducing the spread of the Zika virus and other illnesses. I've taken a lot of hits on the football field, but nothing has ever hit me as hard as cancer. I'm Dak Prescott, and my mom died from colon cancer in 2013. I live every day thinking about the way she hurt. Colon cancer can be prevented and treated, so if you're over 50, get screened now. Before we get back to our program, let's take a look at the Farm Week calendar for you. Beginning September 7th is a seven-week, one-day-per-week course it will partially fulfill the requirements to become a certified master naturalist. Training takes place in the classroom, in the laboratory, and in the field. It all begins at 5.30 p.m. on September 7th at the Coastal Research and Extension Center on Pops Ferry Road in Biloxi. Registration is $250 per person. And on the last day of this month, that will be Thursday, August 31st, a sweet potato field day is scheduled in North Mississippi. It takes place at the Pontotoc Ridge Flatwoods Branch Experiment Station on Highway 15 in Pontotoc. Topics on the agenda include sweet potato breeding and variety development, insect and weed management, and food safety. Registration begins at 8 a.m. on the 31st. Tours of the station's sweet potato projects begin at 8.30. Now it's all free, including a steak lunch at the end of the program. Now check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. The mosquito is an insect we often think of this time of year, and it's not because we love them. It's because their itchy bites are a nuisance when we're trying to enjoy outdoor activities with friends and family. Plus, some species can even carry and transmit disease. Well, now scientists have developed a genetically engineered mosquito, and the insect is being given the green light by the federal government. Researchers say the development may reduce the use of pesticides while also reducing the spread of the Zika virus and other illnesses. Colleen Bradford Krantz has a story for us. Last summer, some Southern Floridians were pondering the possible release of a transgenic mosquito that might slow the spread of the Zika virus. Sam Glucksman, a plant doctor at Hundley Farms, was less concerned about a genetically modified bug than the corn silk flies invading the company's sweet corn fields. Not many people are talking about it. Um, again, it probably has a lot more to do with the fact that we don't 
have a lot of Zika cases here in Palm Beach County, or at least where I am. Um, I would say down south is probably, they're probably talking about it a lot more. Residents of the Florida Keys, where release of the newly engineered bug is still pending, did talk about it. Some protesting and others advocating for slowing the spread of the potentially debilitating virus. The genetically engineered mosquito joins an altered diamondback moth in New York State in having been given the federal government's green light in terms of no significant environmental impact related to pending open field trials. Several decades of lab work have set in motion the potential for genetically altered bugs that some say may reduce the use of pesticides while protecting human health. The mosquito species that carries malaria in Africa is anticipated to be an early target. In the case of insects of human health concern, uh, there's, there's uh, a strong argument to be made that eliminating those insects locally or, or perhaps even globally uh, might, actually, uh, might actually be a good thing. Some, however, are leery of being quite so aggressive in altering a species population. These mosquitoes have a role in the ecosystems in which they live. Uh, in the case of Anopheles gambi in Africa, this is their natural environment. We're not talking about wiping out uh, all 3,000 species of mosquito that exist in the world. We're, uh, it's a technology that would be specifically targeted in the case of Africa to the, the human malaria transmitting mosquito Anopheles gambi. Regardless, Obrocta and Glucksman believe the public needs to be better informed. Most average people really don't know the facts and the science behind it. I think the biggest misconceptions are that these animals are going to get loose and somehow mate with native indigenous species and create some crazy mutant that's going to be resistant to everything and is going to eat your children while you sleep. People are just so scared. Besides potentially benefiting human health, proponents also see the possibility of using genetically engineered bugs to reduce insecticide use. If it works, Great, we don't have to introduce possible poisons or toxins to the environment and kill off, you know, non-target animals. That would be the pro. The con would be what's saying that those mosquitoes are gonna stay here. It's just like any other biological control. I mean, you can release them, but as soon as you do, they're free to go wherever they want. It doesn't mean they're gonna stay here and take care of your problem. They might go next door and take care of that guy's problem. As with the decades-old radiation sterilization programs that nearly wiped out several problematic insects, entomologists like Obracta say the releases would need to be coordinated over a large geographic area. Oxitec is also involved with Cornell University's pending field trials in upstate New York, where genetically engineered diamondback moths would be released in a 10-acre area. Female offspring die before reproducing. Diamondback moths, which quickly develop resistance to insecticides, cause an estimated $4 billion in damage worldwide annually to food crops like broccoli, cabbage, and cauliflower. In the plant crop world, it's a huge catch-22 because people complain that we use too many chemicals, and, um, but yet you don't want a single spot on your tomato, and you want that tomato to be nice and juicy, but you don't want any bruises on it. And it can't have any pesticides on it whatsoever. It has to be totally clean and perfect and the right color. It can't be kind of green. It has to be all red. You know, at the same time, the only way to do that is to use the very things that you are telling us that you don't want us to use. Obrocta says that gene drive, a powerful tool that has yet to be tested outside the laboratory, allows an individual bug's genetic code to be passed to nearly all of its offspring. By engineering all the insects to be male, for example, scientists could wipe out a species in an area. Gene drive, which can occasionally occur in nature, could help reduce human health threats or push out invasive species from an area. Non-native insects and pathogens cost an estimated $40 billion annually in the United States alone. This is not to say that the scientific community has not considered the pitfalls to the process. There's been a lot of discussion about applying these types of technologies uh, for the purposes of controlling, say, invasive species of all types, not just insects, but fish, plants, and so on. The 
environmental impact can't be dismissed and needs to be investigated for each of these situations where people are planning to try to eradicate a species from an environment. According to Obracta, those who research gene drive's potential are also looking for a way to turn off any modifications should something go wrong. They will also consider potential impact on other species should one disappear. Companies like Oxitec have been waiting for federal or local approval before releasing their genetically altered bugs. It remains to be seen how the rest of the country will view the potential risks and rewards of this new approach for battling pests. And we'll be following future developments with the transgenic mosquito in coming months and years. Well, that's going to do it for us and this week's edition of Farm Week, but you want to make sure to tune in again next week. The opportunity to become a master naturalist is right around the corner. We'll give you a look at the program and explain why you may want to consider taking part. On the Food Factor, Natasha offers tips on making school lunches fun and healthy. And Dr. Gary Bachman reveals some great looking plants that thrive in the late summer heat. Again, that's all next time here on Farm Week. Well, we thank you so much for joining us this week. I'm Leighton Spann. Remember, if you missed a story, you can find past episodes of this show under the Shows tab on our website, extension.msstate.edu. And don't forget, follow us on Facebook and Twitter to join in on the conversation. We'll see you next week on Farm Week. <music>